Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's nice to see so many people here for our panel on origami through the ages. I'm really surprised. <laughs> I didn't realize there was such interest um, in this esoteric subject. Um, for the next three hours, you're going to watch us make little birds out of paper. Um, uh, so our, our topic today is uh, Donald Trump and his foreign policy and America's role in the world. And, um, oh, I'm Jeff Goldberg, the editor-in-chief of The Atlantic. Sorry, I should have done it. Thank you, Corey. That was nice of you to say. Um, and uh, we have um, a great panel, and we're going to jump right in. Um, I'm not going to do long bios. Um, you could find them in the app, but this is Corey Shockey. The, she has one of the world's longest titles, so I'll just give the title. <laughs> that will take up 20 minutes. Um, Deputy, Deputy Director General of the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London. Did yeah, I do that? Yeah, I'm so it. prepared. It's unbelievable. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Tom Wright in, in the middle. Um, uh, from a middle-of-the-road institution, the Brookings <laughs> Institution, great foreign policy scholar, um, as well, and Evelyn Farkas on the end from the Atlantic Council. Um, everybody's worked in government. They've done amazing things. You can read about it in your phone. Um, uh, just trust me. Trust me. We pick high-quality panelists for you. Um, I want to um, jump right in with Tom, if that's all right, uh, because Tom did something very unusual two and a half, three years ago. Um, uh, what he did was he took Donald Trump seriously. Um, and he wrote one of the first pieces that I saw, this is at, at a point when I was writing about foreign policy, and, and wasn't taking this seriously. I was taking it to be the um, reality TV show that I thought it was. Um, but what Tom did was Tom actually read Donald Trump, um, looked at the history of his thoughts uh, dating back to the early, mid-'80s, and. Um, and came up with uh, what you could call uh, sort of the outline or the, the framework of a, of a Trump doctrine. I, I remember very specifically, I, I read everything he writes, I remember specifically thinking at the time that I, I read him that, oh, that's adorable, why is he wasting his time? Um, <laughs> it turns out um, that he was prescient. Um, and I was hoping that, Tom, maybe what you can do is um, tell everybody what you discovered and, and, and um, and how what you discovered is manifesting itself today. And then I'll ask uh, Corey and, and Evelyn to, to um, respond to that and see if they agree that there is such a thing as a coherent Trump doctrine. Sure, thanks, Jeff. And it's a great uh, pleasure to be here uh, with, with, with friends. And uh, it, it seems a little odd to be talking about you know, ideas, the Ideas Festival and Donald Trump. I know the thing I hear the most is, you know, he doesn't have a policy, he doesn't have ideas, but if you look, you know, throughout our historical experience, ideas are not necessarily sophisticated or good to be impactful, right? You can have bad ideas and they can be very impactful. You can have unsophisticated, very simple ideas and they can be impactful. So, you know, just because Donald Trump may not be the most knowledgeable person in the world or his ideas may not be particularly uh, developed doesn't mean they don't have a power to them. And, uh, the article Jeff uh, describes um, uh, back in sort of early or late 2015, early 2016, I just went back and looked at everything he had sort of said and written about uh, foreign policy. And it turns out, I thought there would be really nothing there, but I was watching a, um, uh, a rally in Iowa on CNN in like November, December 2015. And in the middle of this rally, Donald Trump says, you know, the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty of 1962 is really unfair and we should change it. And I was like, how does he know about that? Like, did somebody say that to him on the plane on the way up? And so I went back and I looked, and that's really how I, why I started. And it turns out that he talked incessantly about the world from the mid-'80s on. He had a full-page ad in the New York Times in 1987 that outlined his views on American foreign policy. And the difference between what he said then and what he said today is nothing. It's, it's almost exactly the same. And uh, my sort of argument was that he has three or four things that he believes that he's been perfectly consistent on over time. He's, he really dislikes America's alliances and he thinks allies are ripping America off. He really dislikes free trade. He disagrees with all free trade deals since World War II. Uh, he likes authoritarian strongmen um, and he particularly likes authoritarian strongmen of the Russian variety, right? <laughs> and, and that's... Um, that's from 87, and ever since, you'll, you'll be very hard-pressed to find anything that he says off the cuff 
or when he's speaking passionately that contradicts any of those and he keeps going back to them. So my only point is that he's not a blank slate, right? He's not someone who is just uh, being manipulated by advisors or uh, doesn't really know uh, what he wants. He knows what he wants. And last year, he was somewhat constrained because he wasn't used to being president. And he had all these senior people around him, and he was sort of boxed in. This year is the year that he's breaking out. He's breaking out and trying to make good on those ideas. And I think that's what we're seeing. It's what we're seeing with the possible Putin meeting coming up. It's what we saw in Korea. It's what we've seen on trade uh, with the G7. Uh, so I think he is much more ideological than people think. And that, you know, I think is uh, somewhat of concern. Does the, uh, Evelyn, does this count as a doctrine or are these just glandular impulses? I mean, I think they're more than impulses. They clearly reflect a viewpoint he has, a perspective he has on the world, which shockingly and alarmingly, I would say, hasn't changed you know, in multiple decades. He has a point about, about some of the other things he says about people being left behind by globalization, but all of the things that Tom outlined make no sense when you look at the alternative picture, which is to say, for someone like me, I mean, Corey's living in Europe right now, but I'm the descendant of people who fled Europe, who fled in the aftermath of war and revolution to come to America to benefit from the system that we set up to make sure there wouldn't be another international world war, to make sure that we would have increased peace and prosperity through collective security institutions and also collective economic institutions. So, the fact that he has failed to appreciate what all of that has brought him and us is, is kind of shocking to me. Right. And, and on top of that, of course, you know, we can talk, we have plenty of time here on the podium, we can talk about the neo-fascist elements that he's also woven into his worldview, I would call it. Right. Corey, I mean, do, uh, let me ask you about Tom's outline of, of, of year one, uh, sort of learning and being boxed in, year two, um, breaking out the Iran, leaving the Iran deal, for instance, uh, North Korea and so on. Um, what does year three look like? I, I am as worried as you are about that. I agree with Tom's description, not just that the president has fixed views on three crucial things, on out alliances, on trade, and on immigration. And those have been impervious to change over the last 40 years. So you shouldn't expect them to change. And in the president's defense, he campaigned on those issues, got elected on those issues, and it seems to be aggravated that the senior people around him are not helping him carry out an agenda consistent with them. Right. And so the dismissal of Tillerson, the dismissal of McMaster, uh, the defense secretary is the last one standing who has a worldview roughly consistent with American presidential administrations of the last 70 years. Let's do something as an exercise. I'm going to ask each of you to say, to give us something good that he's done on the world stage. Possible? Absolutely. Go ahead. Um, enforcing the- Give you two minutes to think of something, by the way. <laughs> no, no, I got it. Uh, yeah. In I got it. I enforcing the prohibition against chemical weapons use. That's the um, one. That, that matters to do. The president You mean did the two it, strikes on Syria? The two strikes on Syria. Did the two strikes on Syria mean anything? Yeah. You don't so, think Assad will ever use chemical weapons again? Because no, of those I think strikes? Assad will use chemical weapons every single time he can, and we ought to penalize that every single time. I would argue that the president, having chosen such a limited strike, for the reason, seems to me, the, the plausible reason of risk of wanting to limit the risk of escalation with Russians in close proximity. Again, that's not a problem he created, and he made a reasonable choice there. And what would be an even better policy is if every time Assad used chemical weapons, we took a little more of his conventional capability away from him, because right. um, he's using them for tactical reasons. Um, but can I just stay on this question, because I, I don't want to forget this one. Do you think that Barack Obama's hesitation on Syria and on other issues created conditions in which a president like Donald Trump could come to power? Uh, well, I think that's a pretty slim read on which to put the entirety of Trump's Yeah, no, I understand success. that, but, but... But I do think President Obama was dumb to draw a red line he wouldn't enforce, and then when he didn't enforce it, it had ripple effects 
the Japanese were worried, what does this mean if an American president is not going to enforce a red line that he voluntarily puts out there? So yeah, I do think it was damaging, and I do think the only thing President Trump has done that has that American allies have taken heart with was the enforcement of the red line in Syria. Uh, I don't have, I'm afraid I don't have another example. I, I, I don't think that there, there was, I think that's a, certainly a, a plausible case, First but I don't think there's any. In practice right here. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think many of the things that are often cited, you know, he's a point on the 2% with NATO. I don't really think he does. I think the obsession has been massively counterproductive. You know, I, I think that on, you know, the Middle East, he's actually sort of continued some of President Obama's policies of retrenching. The Syria strike has been a cover for a broader retreat from the region, and that's been pretty clear uh, this year. You know, might think that's good or bad, but it's you know pretty disorderly. Um, so I, I think it is. I think its team have done some good things. I think uh, Secretary Mattis has been impressive. I thought that uh, you know Secretary Pompeo has a good opportunity to correct course in the State Department. So I often see things that his administration do that I think, okay, that's reasonable. But I think he. Um, you know, his influence, I think, is very, very sort of destabilizing and extremely impulsive, and that's uh, quite disruptive. So, again, I agree with Corey on the, on the Syria issue. I've worked WMD, weapons of mass destruction issues, pretty intensely, and every one of the reports, studies, whatever you want to write about, it starts with you got to maintain the taboo on the use of weapons of mass destruction. So even if it doesn't deter leaders necessarily every time, you have to try because it's very important to maintain the principle of non-use of chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons. Right. I think there's another thing. And this was a Trump decision, actually, not his cabinet, though they were pushing it heavily, which is providing the lethal defensive assistance to the Ukrainians, something that we didn't do under the Obama administration, though we had many um, discussions about it, <laughs> repeat discussions about it. And when you were it. in the Obama administration, you when, wanted to. I wanted to, yes, that's yeah, correct. Right. And the president had his reasons. They had to do with not wanting to escalate the situation. I disagreed that it would with the notion that it would escalate the situation, and I think the facts have borne that out, but nevertheless, I understand the calculus the president made at the time, um, and I cer certainly wasn't the one with the responsibility, so I don't want to second guess his decision. Having said that, it was the right decision to provide that assistance to the Ukrainians, so they could at least have a deterrence against the Russians, that if they come across in tanks, they will get killed by these anti-tank weapons. They're defensive, they're lethal, they might make Putin think twice. None of you has mentioned North Korea. Is there any upside at all to the outreach to North Korea? There is upside to the outreach to North Korea, which is that this is an extraordinarily dangerous circumstance that the North Koreans were accelerating their nuclear tests and their long-range missile tests. And President Trump was accelerating the crisis as well with all of this loose talk. So, so I do think there was a strong argument for meeting with the North Koreans. But I think, unfortunately, the president made a series of compromises that are not only detrimental um, to solving the North Korean nuclear weapons crisis, but are making America's allies who rely on us, on our security guarantees, like Japan, extraordinarily nervous at the ease with which the president's willing to play make a deal um, and giving things the big public meeting that the North Koreans wanted and an end to American and South Korean military exercises without getting anything in return for it. Tom, as the resident Trumpologist, <laughs> why, how do you pivot as a leader from, it's a, it's a, it's a paying job, you know. <laughs> and, you know uh, uh, how, how do you pivot so quickly from the rhetoric he was deploying against Kim, little rocket man and all that stuff, to, um, to making concessions, I think this is analytically, you'll tell me if I'm being analytically unfair, making concessions to North Korea that if President Obama had made those concessions, he, he would have been impeached by a Republican Congress. How do, you, how do you pivot so? How do you explain that, looking at Donald Trump's own background? Yeah, I mean, I think he, he the way he looks at North Korea and why he took it seriously was that he cares about direct threats to the United States, right? He doesn't care about threats to allies. He doesn't care about regional uh, instability. He doesn't really care about Japan or South Korea or the South China Sea or any of that. So he comes in. He also has this 
weird fixation with nuclear weapons. His uncle was a scientist at MIT. He tried to get on the US negotiating team with the Soviet Union in the mid-1980s. Um, you know, he, he asked- That would have been the, something. The, <laughs> the Reagan administration if he could run the negotiation. So he's had this sort of lifelong sort of obsession with nukes. So he comes in and there are, you know, Obama tells him what's going on and then there are these missile tests. And I guess for a child of the 50s and, and, and with everything else he sort of thought about this, this is a very real thing. So I think he reacts very aggressively. Um, but he's always had this sneaking admiration for Kim Jong-un, right? In the campaign trail, he said, you know, Kim Jong-un, bad guy, but you got to hand it to him. Mid-20s, he got rid of all his rivals, killed all his family. <laughs> That's pretty impressive. You know, so he's had this, he's had this, I, I mean, seriously, he's had this sort of respect because he sort of thinks that strong men who get the job done. But why would he think that a strong man like that would yeah. respect somebody who rolls over so easily? Because he doesn't believe, he doesn't believe that he's rolled over. What he believes is he threatened this guy, uh, the guy sort of saw sense, and now they're gonna sit down and sort of do a deal. And I think the deal is basically, you don't t test your missiles as long as I'm in power, and I'll be your best friend, and we'll sort of pretend that denuclearization is happening. I think that's basically the, the, the you know, tacit agreement, and it may work. I mean, I don't think Kim well, Jong-un's gonna test nukes when he has- He doesn't need to. Yeah, when he has this level of, <laughs> of friendship uh, from uh, the uh, American what, what are the chances that this works? I mean, in the, in, the, in the Washington foreign policy establishment, there's this nightmare that Trump gets the Nobel Peace Prize because he actually <laughs> figures out North Korea in a way that other presidents have. It's a remote. I'm not worried. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're, not, you're, not, you're not losing sleep on that? My but, money's on the Greek prime minister, but that's a little. Right. Uh, but, but go to this question. Is there a chance that this could end in the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula? A very slim chance. There's a greater chance it could end or keep a freeze keep a freeze on nuclear testing, keep a freeze on missile tests, and we can live with that situation because we have done that many times before and we were doing it, you know, when the agreed framework was signed in 93, I believe, it held more or less, uh, we can argue about when the cheating started and I can't get into that because it's actually not even public knowledge, but nevertheless, the cheating was evident by the time Bush came into power and he confronted them. But that was a long time that the freeze actually held. Mm -hmm. So, and the cheating was actually on another program. They just started a uranium-based program in addition to the plutonium-based one. It's gonna be very hard now to verify a freeze, much harder than it was in the 90s. But if the North Koreans wanna let us in, you know, if there's a system, maybe the, maybe the best case scenario, we could get something like a freeze. And, and frankly speaking, I think most of the experts would be happy with that. That's pretty much what we have with Iran, although now that's been thrown into right. question as well. So I think it's going a different direction. I think President Trump's threats against North Korea actually did expand the decision space because I don't think they had any effect on North Korea, but I think they had an enormous effect on South Korea. And the, even in the best possible circumstance of a war with North Korea in which the American military could pull off a feat of extraordinary virtuosity in which you identify and destroy all the nuclear weapons, you can either destroy all of the missiles that can range the US, Japan, um, and destroy them or prevent them from being launched, and in the space of three hours take out those 10,000 artillery pieces on the inter-Korean border, even in that instance, you probably have 300,000 dead South Koreans. There's no way that a war on the Korean Peninsula is, is in any way something South Korea can countenance. And so what happened, the, the person who blinked was the president of South Korea, who, who started off and is making compromises all over the place, including on security. Uh, he does not, in my judgment, any longer trust the United States to be a responsible security partner, and he is actually willing to trade that in order to get a soft, gentle reunification on the Korean Peninsula because he's so scared of what President Trump had been doing with all that reckless talk about the war to come with North Korea. 
uh, let, me, let me move this to this lar the larger questions of America's role in the world and whether our allies still believe us and our adversaries still fear us. But let me start narrowly with, with you, and, and please jump in. Um, I mean, you wrote a book with Jim Mattis. Um, you know his thinking. You've experienced the same cognitive dissonance that we all have when we hear Jim Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, go out and talk up the NATO alliance, talk up America's responsibilities in the world, America's role in being a beacon of democracy. And we know that he works directly for a person who is completely transactional in his understanding of, 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 of international affairs. Um, how long can, can this dissonance last? Um, not only with Jim Mattis, but how long before our allies realize that they're dealing with a fundamentally different America, or do they already just realize this? And, and the fig leaf of people like Jim Mattis um, has, has blown away. So I think there have been, um, so everybody is turning keys in the lock, trying to figure out how to deal with an erratic and untrustworthy American leadership. And so uh, the, the basic different models I see are the German Chancellor, Angela Merkel, is trying to keep her distance and be a beacon of Western values, right? Which, which is an unsuccessful strategy. If she needs anything from the United States, she'll have a very hard time getting it. Uh, President Macron, Prime Minister Abe, um, uh, President Xi Jinping in China, and Prime Minister May in the UK are all trying a different strategy, which is uh, personal warmth and engagement in the hope that that translates into policy compromise. That is also not a successful strategy, right? It didn't save the Iran nuclear agreement. It didn't, nothing that those countries want, they have been, it didn't save Japan from trade tariffs. Uh, the third effort uh, is Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, and I think to some extent also the heads of Saudi Arabia and the UAE who are indulging President Trump's kind of worst excesses in order to gain near-term <coughs> tactical achievements. The, the Jerusalem embassy, uh, support for the war in Yemen, um, and that may prove a Pyrrhic victory in that in the case of Israel, it may politicize support for Israel right. in a way that we haven't seen before. And can um, I just add there's an overlap with the business dealings on the Middle East? Excellent Sorry. point, right. The, the Gulf states believe they see an American administration that looks a lot like the Gulf states, as Stephen Cook had written. Right. The other strategy, the only one that I you think... Mean, you mean families uh, that are right. in power in that order to no enrich difference themselves? between the person and the, and the business of the state. Um, the, the person who, although he is taking the greatest heat from the president, I think has the only successful strategy is the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau. Our who, historic enemy. <laughs> right. Well, you laugh, they, be, they won the wars they fought us in. So, um, uh, Justin Trudeau, who is trying not to aggravate the president, but is working around the federal government and working very creatively with states and cities and American businesses to, to create outcomes. My favorite example of which, he has been, as you know, a real voice on climate change. And the, the UN Secretary General admitted last week that the country, the first country that is gonna meet its, its Paris Climate Accord standards is the United States. Despite the hostility of the federal government and no action and support, because the great golden state of California and Chicago and Apple computer, like there, the mistake that other countries are making are dealing only with the federal government. And Canada, I think, because they understand the United States with some intimacy, is working around the federal government with civil society and states and cities. And that's how I would play my hand if I were a foreign leader right but now. But you're describing something terrible, though. I mean, you're describing a situation in which the, the most powerful country in the world, the government of the most powerful country in the world, um, is uh, untrusted across the, 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 the board. I, I mean, and so, so one of the questions that people ask, especially in Washington, is, is, is this. It's a little bit, there's a little bit of fantasy embedded in it. Uh, maybe you can deal with this for a minute. Is, is there a possibility of snapback? Which is to say, let's say the Trump administration is a four-year phenomenon. 
and, uh, and the country in reaction to these four years, um, uh, votes in middle of the road candidate who um, doesn't have a Twitter account and doesn't have all the feelings <laughs> and emotions that Donald Trump has. Uh, is it possible to restore um, a, a slipping position or is, is this a Pandora's box situation in which, um, in, in which we are on some sort of irreversible, unfixable slide? I think it's absolutely possible. I mean, there's a view Which out one, there. Which one? Unfixable slide? No, or no, I think it's that? fixable. It's fixable. But I mean, there's a view out there that, you know, this is not just about Trump. This is structural, right? And and people love to say the conventional wisdom is just about Trump, but actually it's not. It's much deeper than that. And actually, well, look, empires think, do fall. Think, but that has become, I think, the conventional wisdom, right? The conventional wisdom is now that it's sort of deeper and long lasting. But I think a lot of this is to do with Trump, right? You would not have tariffs on Canada or the EU under any other administration. You might have them on China, right? but you'd never have them on that. You'd never have the bus stop you saw at the G7. You wouldn't have these sort of really odd things um, that are going on. right? So I think a lot of it is reversible. I think what's ha I totally agree with Corey's take on what's happening, but I think also all of the major allies and even adversaries around the world don't know the answer to your question, Jeff, right? They don't know whether it's going to be reversed in four years um, or, or um, going to continue, so they're waiting. And the real critical moment is the election of 2020, because I think if, if he's re-elected, then I think it's game over. You know, the so-called deep game state... Game over for the United States ga as Game the, over for, for the, the post-war strategy, right? Yeah. The post-war liberal order, whatever we call it. At that stage, countries say, you know, it was a good run, but the U.S. has decided just to turn against it. Um, I think Trump is empowered. He has people from the first term who know how the plumbing works and can figure out things and actually make things happen. And I think those voices like Secretary Mattis and others who have been sort of pushing for continuity basically give up because at that stage it's no longer an aberration. But I think we're all in this holding pattern. We have this sort of you know, reprieve in a way. Now, things could happen in the interim that can't be fixed. You know, the Iran issue, you know, you can't just resurrect the JCPOA, right? There may be, if there's a financial crisis, we can't undo that. So there's lots of things that could happen once they're broken that can't be fixed. But right now, some things are, are in that category, but a lot of things, I think, can be reversed if the right, you know, uh, folks, you know, are elected, if that's your view. and. You know, then, then maybe. But, that but what's your hunch? Is this a Trump-specific phenomenon, or, or, look, we, we, we know. I mean, we, 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 we held this belief in abeyance for for obviously 25 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union. But but we all know that empires rise and that empires fall. That nobody lasts. Nobody stays in power forever. Um, China's rising again after two centuries of of sort of collapse and dissipation. Um, do you think that the 70-year-old post-war international order created and maintained and enforced by the United States, is there a chance that it's just over? And, and Donald Trump is the Baroque expression of that fatigue on the part of America writ large? Fantastic. Yeah. I, I, Thank sorry, you very much. Um, uh, no, sorry. Were you gonna say oh, well, just very quickly. I mean, I, I think, yes, there's a chance that it could be eroded, but I actually think it will continue because other things Will, will cause its uh, return, right? I think the rivalry with China and Russia um, will, over time, challenge the U.S. in such a way that people want to try to push back internationally. And so it's not, yeah, if, if, if we just stayed sort of where we are, I think it would probably fall apart, but I think there are other challenges out there that will motivate people. Right. So. so it's not just the liber liberal international order, the, the post-Cold War structure and systems. It's also about ideologies, in a sense, because we're systems of government. And I would posit that what happened is that we actually have had an ongoing struggle between democracy and autocracy that's now playing out worldwide. So it's not just Trump, as you said. It's happening in the Philippines. It's happening in, across Europe. You know, there are plenty of other places where democracy is fighting for its life, and the center has worn out, and every, everything's polarized to the right and the left. And I think that's just a natural kind of cycle. And so we, as, as, who care about democracy, need to fight back against the forces that would favor autocracy because it works well and it feels good for them. Mm -hmm. a quick intervention. I would just ask one quick point, which is that we shouldn't underestimate how durable the order that the hard men who won World War II built. 
Um, and one of the things that is sustaining it right now in a period of American inaction is that America's allies are actually stepping forward. The Japanese, the Australians, and the South Koreans are keeping the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership afloat, buying us time for us to come to our senses. You see in a whole bunch of areas that the British and French are doing freedom of navigation operations in Chinese waters. You see America's allies groping for ways that they can buy time and to figure out, and even French President Macron beginning to talk about how um, the United States isn't the only power strong enough to sustain this order. Mm. He's probably wrong, but as a time buying strategy, it, I expect it'll work for, for until we years. come over until we get over this episode of this lost weekend of foreign policy. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, before we go to question, I, I just want to I want to go to um, a specific issue that is actually I mean I think it's the heart of the mystery of Trump's beliefs, and that is his relationship, his idea about Russia. You're a Russia expert. Um, I, give give us your responsible speculation. Um, or irresponsible if you're feeling, you know, <laughs> altitude sickness or something. Um, uh, what, is it simply that he admires um, autocrats and Putin seems like a strong man, he takes his shirt off, he wrestles bears, whatever he does. Um, what do you think explains, uh, and there obviously is a clear pattern, uh, a, 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 just a, a very clear unwillingness to punish Russia for obvious violations of international laws and norms. What, yeah. what do you think is operating So first I'd like to say I'm an expert on U.S.-Russia relations, not Russia qua Russia, just so I don't get the real Russia watchers upset. Okay. Um, so having gotten that off my chest, um, I believe that there are a couple of things at work here. One, he has always wanted to do business with Russia. That's, that's just a fact. And part of the reason why I think you wanted to do business with Russia, now under the Soviet system, I don't know why, it may be just that they were the other power, and so the power thing appealed to him. Under the post-Soviet era, and now specifically under Putin, he's gone over there, he's enjoyed the culture, it's a very macho kind of culture. We know the stories about Donald Trump and women, and of course there's a dossier that's alleging that women were involved there too. Whether they were or not, there was a Miss America contest. Obviously he likes that kind of culture. And the Russian culture, you just go to a security conference and see how many women you see there. Um, you know, it's, it's different. And so for him, he probably felt very comfortable there. And there were these business opportunities and they played by rules that maybe he recognized were a little more fast and loose, certainly there's rampant corruption in Russia, and we know the real estate world in New York needs to be policed better. So I will say that there, he has real interest at stake here, and then there is also the fascination with the culture, and certainly the strongman thing that Tom mentioned before. And then Putin may well have something on him. Oh, because, also that. Because I, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense for him to be that enamored with Russia. Do you think there's any yeah. chance that Putin has something on him? I, I, don't, I don't know, and you know, I mean, all I know is that he, he's always been pretty favorable to Russia. You know, my view is we wait for Mueller to report. Um, I don't think we know a fraction of what he knows, so wait and see in that, but I, I can give you my benign interpretation of why he's pro-Russia. Um, he tends to have problems with countries that the United States is providing security for or has an economic relationship with, right? That's his whole thing, right? He's he always feels that interdependence is a raw deal for America on trade, and he's against every sort of alliance protection agreement that's out there. And Russia is a country that the US has never protected in a security way, quite the reverse. And there's no economic relationship between the two countries. So he doesn't have- In the 90s. In the, right, but he doesn't have, he doesn't, I mean, there was very limited economic interdependence between the US and Russia at any period. And you know, there's no security relationship uh, relative to any other type of alliance. Mm -hmm. So there's no beef he has with them, right? There, he has no problem with them at all. He doesn't care about them in Ukraine or Georgia. It doesn't matter. He definitely doesn't care about oppression at home. And he has the strongman thing. So I think he just, in his mind, he thought, why should I care about, about Russia as a threat? What have they done to us? Like, they're not, 
you know, they're not stealing our jobs and they're not taking our tax dollars uh, to, ha you know, to have the military and protect. Uh, the only, I agree with that. The only thing I would add is that what is striking is how strong um, Trump administration Russia policy has been despite the president's personal proclivities. Well, this is the cognitive dissonance the so far. The Treasury Department has, has not only uh, brought sanctions against Russians, they brought another round most recently. The president actually signed and even mostly implemented the sanctions against the Russian that the Congress passed. The United States expelled 60 Russian diplomats more than every other country combined in response to the poisoning of Skirpal in Britain. So actually the, the mystery is how is their policy so good? And it's not even just coming from the outposts of sensibility like the Secretary of Defense, the Treasury Department has been the main force on, the, on driving right. this policy. Although Very it's been selective, because I, I have to jump in, because Senator Menendez put out a press release today, so the ranking member, senior Democrat on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, basically saying, you guys have not implemented the big sanctions package on Russia for everything it's done in Ukraine, Syria. There are specific sanctions on defense and intel sectors they haven't implemented. So it's true, they have done some things which have made people like us very happy, but there's a whole raft of things that they haven't done yet. So they're kind of, um, they're, they are dragging their heels in some areas. And he's about to meet Putin. I mean, you know, we said we don't know yeah. what's gonna come out of, out of that in a few weeks. Um, why don't we go to questions? Uh, are there mics, uh, running mics? Yeah, okay, great. Um, Ryan, we'll start right back there, if you don't mind. And um, listen, please, um, phrase, uh, fr please frame your question in the form of a question, because um, we don't have a lot of time. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm surprised I'm first here. Uh, speaking on Putin, uh, you know, there's been some indications that he's talking regularly, directly with Trump on his cell phone. Any comments on that? There was a news article where he was quoted, I know Putin did that long recent interview, he does that long you know, interview every year, his annual like, call-in interview thing, and he said, we speak frequently. And then I think Trump may have also said something like that. I would like to know more about that as well. I frankly think foreign intelligence agencies are, this is just a bonanza for them because the president doesn't appear to make any distinction between uh, where and what he says. Disregarding China in the, um, in the uh, China seas, um, if we disregarded that, why wouldn't it make sense for Putin, who doesn't want to spend money for other people, to, he stopped the war games, um, why wouldn't he just get out of uh, South Korea and uh, get out of Germany and let everybody fend for themselves and then get the Nobel Prize? Um, why isn't that part of, the simplicity of his thinking. <laughs> I, I think he would like to do that. I mean, there's a lot of resistance in the system, but you know, I think what you think of that depends on your point of view. You know, people can disagree, but my view is if the US did that, it would lead to security competition that could lead to major regional wars that would drag the United States back in, and that was a lesson of the 20s, you know, so, but I think, you know, reasonable people can disagree on it. And, and the, the, sorry, the, the intelligence community agrees with you because the latest report by the director of national intelligence, so it's all, the entire community says, we're at the greatest danger of interstate war that we've been in since World War II. Um, over there, is that, yeah, thank you. Rudy Lenz, uh, Aspen, Germany. Uh, I would like a question to NATO. We just had the first meeting with the Aspen Strategy Group and the European Strategy Group, which was recently founded in Brussels last week. And there was one big fear that the upcoming NATO summit would show another tectonic catastrophe because nobody knows what uh, Trump will do with the communique, which is already formulated, but nobody knows if it will really work. And he might sell us out on the 15th of July when there is a planned meeting between him and Putin in Vienna. I would like to address that question to Corey. What do you think about the outcome of the upcoming NATO summit? I'd say the odds of that bad outcome are six in 10. Um, I'd put a 60% probability on that. 
because I think the president genuinely doesn't believe that America's allies are a help to us. He genuinely doesn't believe that the international order, um, the webbing together of like-minded states to com compromise on common action bears us any advantage. And the thing that has to be so frustrating for folks in the administration is that if, for example, you want to start a trade war with China, um, having Europe on your side in that trade war would both be achievable and add enormously to the heft of the American case. So, so the frustration is that the president doesn't actually connect dots um, on things and understand that the main advantage we have over China in any competition between us and over for Russia, or over Russia for that matter, is that most countries in the world actually want us to succeed at what we're doing and are actually willing to help us do those things. And that's enormously rare in the history of hegemonic powers. Um, so it's a great advantage. The president's burning through that goodwill like a wildfire. And yeah, Europeans are right to be worried. I'm worried. Do you have a quick? Yeah, I don't think he's going to go to Vienna on the 15th. Um, the World Cup finals in Moscow on the 15th. So Putin's definitely not going to miss that. Uh, and I think um, Plus, he, usually he's launching an I invasion think, at the end yeah, of one of I, I actually think Putin will invite Trump to Moscow for the final. And I think he'll probably say yes. So I think the meeting will be on the 16th of July in Moscow after celebration the night before. Smart. Which will be really a huge concession, because the Russians make a big deal about meeting everyone at the lower levels and higher level in the middle. Right. Not right. making our president go to Moscow. Right. Before I go to the next question over here, I just have a, a question for, for Corey, prompted by something you said. Um, three years ago, four years ago, you were a, a, a once an advisor to John McCain. Three, four years ago, the Republican Party was a stalwart, uh, very, very muscular in its approach to the world, um, very, uh, a, 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 I wouldn't say enamored of, but very much gripped by a, a belief in democratic expansion uh, combined with the force of arms and obviously very, very suspicious of Russia. Um, give us your 20-second diagnosis of why Republican leadership almost across the board pivoted on a dime to defend Donald Trump's pro-Russia or neutral Russia at least uh, quasi-isolationist policy. Uh, so I can... I sailed on the pirate ship McCain in 2008, as Jeffrey mentioned, and I can feel John's presence every time this question is asked, so I feel the need to give the answer, start with the answer he would give, which is not all Republicans. Right. Um, but I agree with you, it is alarming how But the many only Republicans in Congress who agree with John McCain are all fleeing Congress because they can't win re-election. So that's the point. They're the cowardice exhibited by the leaders of my party in Congress, not just on Russia policy, but on the rule of law, on uh, budget discipline, on all of the things I think of as fundamental elements of conservative philosophy. The, the cowardice has been genuinely shocking. And I think the reason is because <coughs> President Trump came, he's like the blitzkrieg, right? It's a new way of warfare. Nobody quite knows how to fight it yet. They're, everybody's turning keys in the locks to try and figure out, was Mark Sanford gonna lose anyway, or, or did the president make a big difference in that? And I think we're still in the experimentation phase. Mm. Um, so, so I think people are, are still sort of shocked by what by how effectively the president catapulted over uh, 13 other better candidates to win the presidency right. and are scared of the political consequences. I think there was a microphone over here somewhere. Yeah. Is somebody? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Malik Dalan, uh, my question is actually about, I'm, I'm still trying to dig and see and find a Trump doctrine. And Jeff being the man who categorized doctrines in the, in the past, including the Obama doctrine in 2016, I wonder if we can just get the views of your panelists about the Middle East policy, the diplomatic policy about the so-called um, Trump plan, which has been exclusively conducted by his son-in-law. Is right. there anything that you can share? 
Can I, can I just add one intervention? Uh, uh, thank you for the question. I mean, the, what's interesting about, uh, Obama was the revolutionary when it came to understanding Middle Eastern alliances in, in one sense. He, he, he told me in 2016 that he believed that, Iran, that the Arab states, the Sunni states, should learn to share, quote unquote, share the Middle East with Iran. That made people crazy, as you know. Um, uh, Donald Trump seems to be restoring a kind of traditional American view, which is that we're on the side of the Sunni Arabs in Israel and against Shia radicalism, re represented by Iran, uh, Hezbollah, and, to, and the Assad regime. Uh, so it, it seems like that's a restoration, in a way. Am I wrong? Uh, my sense is that, that an additional reflex the president has is that if President Obama did it, I want to do the opposite. <laughs> that might be the core reflex, right? And so what's striking about policy in the Middle East is that uh, you, have seen it, you have seen dramatic breaks, the move of the embassy to Jerusalem, the wholehearted support of, of Sunni governments, um, the not knowing quite what to do about Turkey, uh, but the continuity of policy in Syria, of policy in Iraq, um, of uh, I guess the other place they overturned it is support in Yemen, but we've now seen that stopped, right? On the, in a week ago, the Defense Department refused to continue providing support to the Saudis and the Emiratis uh, because of the way they are carrying out their campaign in Yemen. Right. Any thoughts yes. on that? Oh, sorry. I was no, no, go ahead. Well, I would just say that it doesn't feel exactly as you depicted it, Jeffrey, because there's an element of the Iran equation whereby the Iranians are actually winning in Syria. So they're getting their way. Now it's true that they are lucky because they're <laughs> aligned with Vladimir Putin. <laughs> and so, you know, that's Trump's friend. Right. But, but, but thus far, the Iranians appeal, appear to be gaining the upper hand. Now, the Israelis are pushing back and we haven't seen the game played out to the end. I believe that we're going to have to step in more forcefully, diplomatically for sure, if not economically and even militarily, to assert the leverage that we have right. there. But I, I'm, not, I'm not entirely convinced that he's really pushing back that hard on Iran. Right. I mean, I think he wants to get out of the Middle East, right? I mean, he definitely wants to get out of the Middle East. He wanted to be in because of ISIS, because he, it, like with the North Korean missiles, he saw them as a direct threat. But now that ISIS is on the verge of of a complete defeat, he wants to leave, but he will offer, I think Jeff, you're ex exactly right on this, he will offer full support to Israel, to the Sunni states, you know, morally, um, every other way, but he's basically saying to them, you're on your own, you know, you deal with this. I, I left the JCPOA, Israel, if you want to deal with it, you can, you can do that with the Saudis, and, mm -hmm. and that is a continuity with President Obama in terms of retrenchment from the region. Nice it may be the point. right decision, it may be the wrong decision, you know, I think that, again, that depends on your view of it, but, but I think it is, it is, there is some continuity there. So I wish I had said exactly what Tom said, and I would add that I, I expect the president will withdraw troops from Syria and Iraq um, as the next point of this. Right. Um, I'm going to ask the final question. We only have a second, um, and I want each of you to give me a short answer, if you can. Um, do you think that Trump's, let me find as neutral language as I can, um, spontaneous style of foreign policy making um, <laughs> could lead us into war either in the Middle East or in Northeast Asia um, in the coming couple of years. Yes, and, it, and it's worse than you imagine because his spontaneous style of leadership, as you suggest, also means that we are likely to have to fight those wars without friends by our side. Um, I think there are two problems, two risks with Trump. One is he starts wars. The other is he retreats and sort of sells everyone out. I think the second one is probably higher than the first. And my nightmare scenario, the biggest danger I think facing is it's actually uh, a financial crisis, um, not a war, because um, this administration is uniquely, I think, incapable of dealing with a financial crisis because they don't really believe in international cooperation and there's no one on the economic side that understands markets after Gary Cohn leaving. So um, I think that probably, I say this as a security person, not an economist, but I think that's what I would worry about the most and, and, and that could happen at any point. 
Yeah, so I worry, uh, I mean, I agree with my esteemed colleagues here. I worry about some other, you know, overreaction, getting angry at North Korea and then doing a military strike. Unfortunately, this president is very good at creating crises and not so good at solving them. And that seems to be his alternative. If he's not talking to Kim Jong-un, he might lash out. The second thing is the Middle East. I mentioned that Israel is pushing back. It's asserting its red lines. It's backing up its, its determination that Iran will have no new permanent bases in Syria and that there will be no increased operational capability on the border with Israel in, in Hezbollah territory, if you will. Unfortunately, I don't know whether that's going to last, whether the Israelis will be able to continue to do what they've had success doing, and that would mean increased involvement for the United States. So I worry about those two things. Um, and I had another thought on what Tom was saying. When people tweet at me sometimes and ask me things, you know, well, Evelyn, you're worried about, you know, war, and what about th this or that? What about war with Kim Jong-un? And I usually say, actually, there are few people, believe it or not, who can actually stop war in the United States system, right? But when it comes to an economic war, there are multiple actors making disparate decisions independently, and we don't even, even economists don't understand the economy. Even Gary Cohn doesn't understand the markets. And so the, the thing that they're doing right now, which may be part of a negotiation strategy, it feels very experimental, and that's dangerous. Well, on that happy note, I want to thank our <laughs> panelists, uh, and thank you all very much for coming.